Today I'm going to be preaching on the deity of Jesus Christ. I'm going to go through a lot of the verses that prove Jesus Christ is God. Now I put together, with a lot of help from Gershon, we put together this soul winning bookmark. So what this is, is this is a little cheat sheet. I've got two left, but I can print some more. This is a little cheat sheet. I designed it to be very small like this and fold up because you want it to go inside your Bible, right? But um, I'll make enough for everyone to take because it's good to keep one with you because if you ever get into a conversation and you need to prove a certain point from the Bible, that's what we're kind of putting onto this soul winning bookmark. So on the soul winning bookmark, it's not really like doctrinal issues. It's issues that really are for like unbelievers, false religions and salvation. But a lot of the verses on here are to do with Jesus Christ being God because that is one of the major stumbling points for a lot of false religions that people don't believe that Jesus Christ is God. Like whether you're talking to a Mormon, Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, Muslims that may you know, accept that they have to uh, believe the Bible and things like that. So um, this is why I'm going through this sermon today. I might just turn this... Uh, oh, it's going to be cold. The other one's on. So what I want to go through today is, is all the verses that are on here to do with the deity of Jesus Christ. So not every single verse, but there's a few sections on here to do with the deity of Jesus Christ. And that's what this sermon is today. So just to let you know the context so that you can use this so then you understand why the verses are on this list. Okay, so there's two here. I'll leave them over here um, for if you want to grab them if you don't already have a copy. And if we run out, it's all right because I can print a few more for next week. So the deity of Jesus Christ is an important one. It is a, it is a salvational issue. And don't get it wrong, like, you know, Jesus Christ being God is a salvational issue. You know, people who reject the deity of Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, they are believe, if they reject that, they are believing a heresy, like a, a damnable heresy, one, like a heresy, a false doctrine that you know, will prevent somebody from getting saved if they do not believe it. Now, can, they can believe is obviously get mixed up in false doctrine. That's true. It doesn't undo your salvation. But it's something that if somebody does not believe, they cannot be saved. Right? They can't get saved if they reject this truth. So Jesus being God is, you know, there, there's a, it's, it's, it's a big objection to a lot of false religions, especially to the Islamic religion. There's a very popular online Islamic speaker, Zakir Naik, right? And he, he, he makes this sort of a, a argument. It's a faulty argument, but the argument he always says is, well, he will believe Jesus Christ is God if the, Bible, if, you can, if the Bible quotes Jesus saying, I am God, worship me, right? Which is really a faulty argument because what? One of the premises or one of the presuppositions of that argument is that he actually will believe the Bible as it exists today if it says something, right? Because they don't, they don't, because first of all, they don't even believe the Bible as it exists today. So what does it matter if the Bible even said, quoted Jesus saying, I am God, worship me, he's not going to believe it anyway, right? Why do we say that? Because Jesus says a lot of things in the Bible that they don't accept, right? They don't accept that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And the Bible does actually quote Jesus Christ saying that, right? So John 10, 36. He said, this is Jesus Christ talking of himself. Say ye of him whom the Father had sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemest. So he's saying to them, so this is what I'm going to do in this sermon. I'm going to give you some verses, just give you a little bit of the context so you can understand where this verse comes from. So he's talking to the Jews here in John 10. He's saying, you're saying that I'm blaspheming. Thou, he's like, that sent, say ye of him, he's talking of himself, whom the Father had sanctified and sent into the world, this is him, you're saying, I'm blaspheming. Thou blasphemest because, why are they saying they're bla he's blaspheming? Because I said, I am the Son of God. So you see, so Jesus did plainly claim that he was the Son of God. He was quoted as saying that. But see, we don't believe Jesus is God because he said the exact words, I am God, worship me. Right? It's a teaching of the scripture. And we're going to go through a lot of the verses where you know, he says things very similar to it, but not those exact words. Right? So you just have to be careful. Especially, you know, as we live in a very, you know, you know, a lot of associated with a lot of Muslims. We talk to a lot of Muslims. They say a lot of misleading things. And you need to be careful of it. And when we go soul winning, 
and we'll, we'll knock on a Muslim's door. Some, some things they say to Christians, because see, they, Muslims don't know that, I, 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 you know, a lot of ignorant Muslims, they don't know that there are like different denominations of Christianity, different beliefs within Christianity. And this is why, you know, sometimes when you talk to a Muslim, they'll say things like, you know, we have a book in the Quran all about Mary, right? Well, why do they say that to us? It's because they think every Christian is a Catholic. They think every Christian worships Mary and things like that. So they think if they tell a Christian that there's a book about Mary, they will be like, whoa, really? Huh? So they'll say things like that. You know, but the other things they say to Christians is they'll say things like, you know, you cannot be a Muslim unless you believe in Jesus and you believe the Bible. They'll say that. But you know why it's so misleading? Because they don't believe Jesus is God. Yeah, the Jesus that they believe in is just a prophet. And the Bible that they're talking about is not the Bible that exists today, like the Bible that we're reading, the Bible that has been you know, proven, that it's been preserved and things like that, and we have old manuscripts, all this sort of... No, no, the Bible they're talking about is the one that Jesus supposedly wrote. That doesn't, that has, there's no evidence of it anywhere, right? But they don't need it anymore. Why? Because they have the Quran. So you see, so you just have to be careful that they say things like this, but you know, don't be tripped up by them. But this is why it's important to understand these doctrines, understand these verses. And you may not memorize them all, and this is why we created that cheat sheet. So at least when you refer to them, you understand the, you know, a bit of the context about it, and that there are a lot of verses in there that you could point them to show that it's not just a Christian belief. It is something that the Bible clearly teaches, right? So, you know, what is Jesus? Is Jesus God or is Jesus the Son of God? Some people get confused here. And you know what the answer is? Is he's both, right? Is Jesus God? Yes, he's God. Is he the Son of God? Yes, as well. Because, you know, God's got, we're not talking about God's nature here today and what he's able to do and not able to. Obviously, God is more complex than a limited human being. So, his nature, his spiritual nature, which is three in one, and the fact that that God can become flesh is also a complex thing to understand. But, you know, it's not that it's out, outside the realms of ability of God, right? So this is one of the great mysteries that is revealed to us, that Jesus Christ in the flesh is truly God manifest in the flesh. First Timothy 3.16, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. So it's not that this, it's great, is the mystery of godliness in the sense that it is not comprehensible, right? Because we are told this is how it is. So we can understand it and uh, reveal this truth. That's what it's saying. It's saying hey, the mystery of godliness, which is unknown, but it's now known, right? What is that mystery of godliness, which is very great? That God was manifest in the flesh. You see how it's Jesus Christ is not just a man. It's not just an exalted being. It's not just an exalted angel. He is God manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Colossians 2, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. So you see, this is a, verse 9 is about Jesus Christ. For in him, who? Jesus Christ dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So what is the fullness of the Godhead? Father, Word, Holy Ghost, right? These three are one. And in Jesus Christ dwells that fullness of the entire Godhead bodily. That's what it means by God manifest in the flesh. So that's what the Son of God is. The Son of God is God manifest in the flesh. That's why it's Jesus Christ God. Well, he's the son of God. Well, he's both, right? So Jesus Christ, the man, Jesus Christ is God. That's one of the things about Jesus Christ. Is he's both 100% man and 100% God. Let's go on. So we read in John 8. Now, why is it a big deal? We saw in John 8 why it's a big deal. Jesus says here, I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins, for if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. This is why believing Jesus Christ as God is a salvational issue. Because Jesus Christ is saying here, if you do not believe that I 
am he. He shall die in your sins. Now, who is the he that is being talked about in John 8? Right? Well, he talks about this he, he that sent me, he. Then they then said they unto him, Who art thou? Jesus said unto them, Even the same that I said unto you from the beginning. I have many things to say and to judge of you, but he that sent me, so you see, he's the he, he's that person. He that sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. Look at this. They understood not that he spake to them of the Father. You see that? Jesus Christ is God the Father. Right? And he's saying to them, if you do not, you do not believe that, you shall die in your sin. So this is why it is a big deal. They needed to accept the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now let's go through some of the verses. Now the first section, Jesus is God. These are the verses that either directly or you know, very indirectly you know, make the claim that Jesus Christ is God. Let's go to the first one, Isaiah 9, 6. This is an Old Testament passage in the book of Isaiah, prophetical about the Messiah that is to be born. Right? For unto us a child is born, Unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. Look at this. The Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Right? So there's a lot of things about Jesus Christ. Right? He's wonderful. He's a counselor, but he's also the Mighty God. Not only the Mighty God, he's the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Peace. I think this is one of the very clear verses in the Bible. It's one of our memory verses about Jesus Christ as well. So when you get to the three verses to memorize about Jesus Christ, it's Isaiah 9, 6, John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and then um, Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. All right? So we're about Christmas now. So not only, you know, these are some Christmas verses because it's talking about who's going to be born, but in Matthew 1, 23, this is the prophecy of Jesus Christ being born, his name being Emmanuel. And then it gives us what Emmanuel means. Behold, a virgin shall be with child, shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. So you see how these names are prescribed to Jesus Christ, describing who he is. Wonderful, counselor, it's the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, and he's also God with us. Right? Emmanuel. Here we go now to Matthew 4, 5 to 7. So this is the temptation in the wilderness, Jesus Christ being tempted of Satan. It says, Then the devil taketh him up into a holy city, setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up lest at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. So he's saying, well, here, you know, he is, you know, using Old Testament scriptures to just say, well, we, Jesus should just flippantly just, you know, hurt himself just to show that he cannot be hurt, which is not the right application of the verse. And this is why, you know, he's, he's, he's rebuking um, sort of Satan for it. And he's saying he's tempting it to sort of prove that he, you know, in the wrong way, proving that he is the Son of God, because how was he going to prove that he was the Son of God? He wasn't going to cast himself off, and then, you know, the angels were going to carry him. You know, how was Jesus going to prove that he was the Son of God? He was going to die on the cross, right? And the rising again was then going to declare him as the Son of God, right? So, I don't know, you know, people may have different opinions on what is the temptation here, but, you know, it could be a temptation to prove who he is, in the wrong way, right? Using an Old Testament passage of, you know, the angels are not going to let you, you know, dash your foot against a stone, but this is not how he was meant to be declared the Son of God. He's going to be declared the Son of God by the resurrection. But look at how Jesus responds. Jesus said unto him, because who is he tempting? He's tempting the Lord Jesus Christ. But how does Jesus Christ respond? It is written again, look at this, thou shalt not tempt who? <coughs> the Lord thy God. You see there? So that's Jesus Christ saying, using a verse, saying, hey, don't tempt 
the Lord thy God. But who is he tempting? He's tempting the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's one that uh, Katerina pointed out to me. It's an interesting one. This is where the disciples are plucking ears of corn on the Sabbath day and then Jesus Christ is rebuking the Pharisees for them condemning, you know, I guess, works of grace and mercy on the Sabbath day, right? Because we don't undo love and grace on the Sabbath day. And Jesus responds to them saying, the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. Now, who is the Lord of the Sabbath day? That's, that's Jehovah, that's God. But just here, Jesus saying, hey, Son of Man, that's here, he's talking about himself, is Lord even of the Sabbath. Right? And here's it again in Mark 2. And he said unto them, the Sabbath was, not, was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. Mark 10. Mark 10. This is a situation where the rich young ruler is coming to Jesus, right? Asking him. Came, gone forth into the way. There came one running, kneeled to him, and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And then Jesus obviously gives him an answer that's, you know, work salvation, trying to show him that you can't get to heaven by good works. You're not, nobody's good. But before he does that, he gets the guy to reflect on what he just called him. He says, he's calling me good master. Jesus said unto him, why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. So you see how he's getting the rich young ruler to reflect that if you're calling me good master, you must be acknowledging him as God, right? Because there's only one good, that's God. If Jesus is good, he's God. Otherwise, he's a sinner like the rest of us, right? But he can't be a sinner because he needs to be our saviour. Let's go on to John 1. John 1.1. 1, 1. So this is now the beginning of John 1, talking about the word of God being the light of the world. John the Baptist pointing to that light. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. So here is, a, this, this is, I believe, a verse alluding to the Trinity. If the word was with God, and the word was God. Now who was the word? The word was Jesus Christ. This is why in verse 14 of John 1, it says here, and the word was made flesh, like we saw in 1 Timothy 3.16. God was manifest in the flesh. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld His glory, the glory as the, of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Right, so the Word that was made flesh, that was with God, was God. This is why Jesus Christ is God. John 10, how he's talking to the Jews, he's talking about those who will, are saved, will hear Him. Right? My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. So we're in Jesus Christ's hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. So are we in Christ's hand, or are we in the Father's hand? Well, I and my Father are one. It's the same hand. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. So you can see there, like, you know, in John 8, you know, he's saying very plainly, I am he, you know, saying, I am, my father are one. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, Many good works have I showed you from my father, for which of those works do you stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, and because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. So you can see here that the Jews understood what Jesus was claiming. Right? So Jesus was not claiming that he just had the same purpose as God, you know, that he was, you know, one in fellowship with God and things like that. The Jews understood that he was claiming divinity here and that's why they accused him of blasphemy. Right? Because they knew that the Messiah was going to come and then they knew the Messiah was going to be God. John 14 6. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. And from henceforth ye know him, and have seen him. So that's a famous verse, you know, where, you know, Philip is saying, show us the way. You know, Jesus is saying, I am the way. Right? Then Philip asks him, 
Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him. Look at how Jesus responds to this question, or this, this request, to show that he, Philip is saying to Jesus, show us so we can see the Father. Look at how Jesus responds. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? See, Jesus is saying to Philip, when you look at me, you are seeing the Father. Why? Because Jesus Christ is the Father, manifest in the flesh. He's the way you see the Father. Right? Because how else can you see? You can't see the Spirit. That's right? so why you can't see God. Right? So how do you see God? Well, we don't see Him, we hear Him. Right? This is why the, we see God through the Word of God. Right? The Word was made manifest, manifest in the flesh. That's why when we see those that saw the physical Lord Jesus Christ, they were seeing God in the same way we see God through the Word. And I love how it all just kind of like, you know, comes together, you know, how, how it's just, it all fits perfectly. You know, even Jesus Christ manifesting the flesh and the Word being the way God is revealed and manifest in the world, in His Spirit. John 20. This is one I like to, to show Muslims, you know, sometimes when I talk to them, but there's a lot of good ones you can show them. It says, After eight days again his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. So, so the context here is, you know, Jesus is resurrected, you know, he's showing himself to his disciples, but first time Thomas was not there. So now, eight days later, Thomas is now with them. Jesus appears to them again. Then came Jesus, because Thomas, remember, this is where we get the phrase, doubting Thomas. The disciples were saying, we saw the risen Jesus. And Thomas was saying, hey, unless I see him and touch him, I'm not going to believe. So this is where that be a doubting Thomas comes from. Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, stood in the midst and said, peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, reach hither thy finger, behold my hands. Reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless but believing. Thomas answered, look how Thomas answered, and said unto him, my Lord and my God. So I've had Muslims say to me that he's just like, it's just like an, expl like an expletive in the sense of just like, oh my God. You know, when people say, oh my God, and he's not calling Jesus God. My Lord and my God. I just think it's a bit of a stretch. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, look at how Jesus responds. Does he say, whoa, 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 wait a second. I'm just the son of God. Right, worship God. No. He says, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed, blessed are they that have not seen and yet believed. So he didn't rebuke Thomas for saying, my Lord and my God. I mean, if he wasn't, I mean, that would be absolutely blasphemous. This is what the Muslims believe, right? It's absolutely blasphemous. Put, put somebody in line with Jesus Christ. I mean, put somebody in line with God, and it is. But it's because he is God that he is able to receive that praise because he is. Acts 7, 59. Let's look at a few others. They stoned Stephen. This is Stephen being killed, calling upon God and saying, look what it says, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. So the Bible there recognizes that Stephen was calling out as he was dying, as being stoned at, he's calling out to who? God. But who did he call out to? Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. 1 Corinthians 15. See, I love this one. This one is great. This is like so obvious, this one. So it is written, so 1 Corinthians 15 is the resurrection chapter, right? So now, in this part of the chapter, it's comparing, comparing the first Adam, right, Adam, with the last Adam, Jesus Christ. So it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul, right, when God breathed into him. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Right, it's the Lord Jesus Christ, Spirit of Christ, raising us from the dead. Howbeit, that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural. So saying the first man is natural. Afterward, that which is spiritual, it's Jesus Christ. The first man, Adam, is of the earth, earthy. Look at what it says about the second man. The second man is the Lord from heaven. That's pretty. That's pretty plain, right? Saying. First man, it's a man made from the dust. He's earthy. The second man is God from heaven. Right? Philippians 2, verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, 
who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. There we go. Jesus Christ, equal with God, being in the form of God. God manifest in the flesh. Hebrews 1. So this is an Old Testament psalm. But Hebrews tells us that this psalm was directed to who? The Son. But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, look at this, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. So there's a few verses where directly, indirectly, saying Jesus Christ is God. And all of them are on that uh, soul winning sheet. Let's look at a few verses now where it shows us that Jesus Christ is eternal. Because sometimes, you know, there's only one that is eternal. That's God. But if we see that Jesus Christ is eternal, this is an attribute that is solely to God. So first we have Micah 5.2. So this is a prophecy about Jesus Christ. You wonder, how did the wise men know when Herod asked that Jesus Christ would be born in Bethlehem? It's because they knew Micah 5.2. But thou, Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Right? So he's eternal, this, this ruler, Jesus Christ. I mean, God in the flesh is from eternity. Matthew twenty two forty one. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? They say unto him, the son of David. So this is Jesus now going back and forth with the Pharisees. He's tripping them up, right? Because they know what the Bible says about the, the Christ, right? So he's like tripping them up here. What think ye of the Christ? Whose son is he? They say unto him, the son of David. He saith unto them, How then doth David in spirit call him Lord? Saying, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, Till I make thine enemies thy footstool. So they're trying to say, well, which one is he? Is he the son of David or is he a lord of David? If David then call him Lord, how is he his son? It's like I say to you, is Jesus Christ God or is he the son of God? Well, here, is he the son of David or is he the lord of David? And no man was able to answer him a word. These are the Pharisees, right? Neither durst, so what does the word durst mean? That's the past tense of dare. So it's like neither dared any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. Right, because they didn't want to admit the truth that he was both. Right? And it's like when, I, when we go through all these verses, in the Bible it's so clear Jesus Christ is both. But, is he the son of God or is he God? Well, he's both. That's what the Bible teaches. Right? Revelation 22, 16. We see here, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. See how he's both? He's the root, right? He's the Lord of David, but he's also the offspring of David. John 8, verse 56. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. So we read this when we saw in John chapter 8. So he's saying, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it and was glad. Right? So what is the day that he's talking about? You know, it could be the day that he's born. You know, maybe he's rejoicing to see the day, you know, of the resurrection. Because this is what I think, this is the day that the Lord made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. I think he's talking about the resurrection. Because if you go and read that psalm, before that, it says, the stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. So even though we use that verse for many days, you know, people will use it for their anniversary, people will use it for their birthday, but the real day that we should rejoice and be glad in it is the day that Jesus Christ rose again, right? So he say, Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet 50 years old, hast thou seen Abraham? He's saying, how can you know Abraham? You're not even 50 years old. How old was he? 30 to 33, somewhere. Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. So you see how Jesus there is making a claim that he existed even prior to Abraham. He was just a man. How could he exist before Abraham when he was born 2,000 years ago? Right? 
So Hebrews 7. Hebrews 7 is about Melchizedek. Now Melchizedek appears, I think, in Genesis 10. Just this random guy, you know, comes out in Genesis 10. You know, he talks to Abraham. Abraham gives him a tenth of the spoils, and he's called the priest of the Most High. Right? So Melchizedek is this mysterious character who is actually a priest that is not after the lineage of Aaron. And he's the priest of the Most High God, and Jesus Christ is called a priest after the order of Melchizedek. But we also believe that Melchizedek is actually Jesus Christ himself, right? Because, because of his attributes. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace, without father, without mother, having without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like under the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. So who is Melchizedek? Well, we believe that he is Jesus Christ because of how he's described. He has no father, he has no mother, doesn't descend from anyone, right? Having neither beginning or days nor end of life. He's eternal, but made like unto the Son of God, by the priest, continually. Revelation 22, verse 13. We see here, Jesus Christ. It's Jesus Christ speaking here in Revelation 22. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. We see there, his eternality. He's the beginning and he's the end. And we see here in Isaiah 44 that God is also the first and the last. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. So you see there, the God that is the first and the last, there's no other God beside him. So if Jesus Christ is claiming to be the first and the last, you see there that he is claiming to be that God that is the first and the last. All right, let's look at some verses on Jesus being the creator. So we know Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Exodus 20.11, For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. <clears throat> all right, so this is a good argument for young earth six-day creation, right? Because they'll say, oh, you know, people say, oh, in Genesis could mean long days, long days, long days. But in Exodus... It's not day by day. In Exodus, it's telling us six days the Lord made heaven and earth and rest of the seven. So it undoes a lot of this gap theory, long day age theory, and all that sort of stuff. So we know here that it was God who created the heaven and the earth. But the Bible also tells us, Colossians 1.15, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Who's that? That's Jesus Christ. For by him, by who? Jesus Christ were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. So that's pretty inclusive, right? Everything created by Jesus Christ. So it makes you wonder who was speaking <laughs> In Genesis chapter 1, you say Jesus Christ was the Word. He was a Word being spoken, but in another sense, He was the one also speaking the Word as well. Revelation 4.11, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honour and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. So what's happening in Revelation? Remember, this is when all the elders bow down and worship Him, you know, sat on the throne, they cast their crowns before him. And what are they saying? Thou art worthy, O Lord. Right? Because they created, he created all things. By pleasure they are and were created. Let's go on to Jesus being omnipresent. This is always a great argument. It always reminds me of a time when we saw him with somebody and we ran into a few Jehovah's Witnesses and the topic of Jesus Christ being God is brought up. And, you know, I wish I had a soul winning thing with me back then because I was trying to think of verses like, oh, I'm going to show these guys in their Bible. Jesus Christ is God. And, and the one person I was with, we sprung this one on him. Right? And then they didn't know how to answer this one. Jesus Christ being omnipresent. 
Because if Jesus Christ is just a man, how is he everywhere? Do you see? See, omnipresence is an attribute of God. And you may, not, you may think of these verses and may not realize that it's a claim of divinity. Matthew 18, 24, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. That's Jesus saying, anywhere in the world where two or three people gather in the name of Jesus Christ, he's saying, I am there with them. Now, how does he do that? Unless he's gone. John 3, 13, this is him talking to Nicodemus. No man has ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, he's talking about himself, even the Son of Man, look at this, which is in heaven. How does the Son of Man be talking to Nicodemus but at the same time in heaven? John 14, John 14, 6, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. He's he's talking about sending the Comforter. We know the Comforter is the Holy Ghost, right? Because he's he's 301. Even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Look, I will not leave you comfortless. He's talking about sending the Comforter, but look at what he says in verse 18. I will come to you. So you see, that's him coming to you, because there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, the Holy Ghost, these three are one. Romans 8. He's talking about Jesus Christ being in us. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. Another one. Colossians 1. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Second th- Corinthians 13. Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. How is Jesus Christ inside every single believer? It's because he's God. It's because he's omniscient. Or he's omnipresent. That's how he's able to be inside every believer. Let's talk about Jesus Christ being the Savior. I don't think anyone would dispute Jesus Christ is the Savior. But do you know that there's only one Savior, and then that Savior is God? Isaiah 43, 11, I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. So the very fact, when we say Jesus Christ is the Savior, that is a statement saying He is God, because there's only one Savior, and that Savior is God, is what Isaiah 43 says. This is why we can't separate the Trinity up too much. We can't separate up God's nature too much. Because when we start saying they're completely separate, then who is Jesus Christ? Are there two saviors now? See, we have to maintain that there is one savior. And that's why the doctrine of the Godhead, of the Trinity, is important. Luke 2.11, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a savior, which is Christ the Lord. That's something we remember at Christmas Day. Acts 20 verse 28. I don't know if you've ever seen this one before. Think about this. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the, all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. Did you see that there? The Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God who? Which he, God, had purchased with his own blood. See there? Because... Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. Titus 2.13, looking for that blessed hope. It's talking about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Saviour, Jesus Christ. You see how the great appearing, we're not seeing God, right? Who are we going to see at the second coming? We're going to see Jesus Christ. He is the great God and our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Jude 25, to the only wise God, our Saviour, Be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. So Jude says there's one Saviour, the only wise God, our Saviour. Be glory and majesty, dominion and power. All right, let's go through some of these a bit quickly. Jesus being worshipped. Jesus receiving worship. Now, only God is meant to be worshipped. Luke 4, 6. This is the temptation in the wilderness. 
devil said unto him, all this power. So the context here, remember Jesus being tempted? There was three temptations. One of the temptations was that Satan wanted to give him all this glory. He says, all this power will I give thee and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me and to whomsoever I will I give it. If thou therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine. So he's tempting Jesus, worship Satan, give him power, give him glory, all the riches of the world. Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. So very clear that we are only to worship God. Therefore, if Jesus receives worship, he is claiming divinity, isn't he? To receive that worship. Well, there's many times in the Bible where Jesus is worshipped. The Christmas story, you know, the wise men following the star, they come over the house where the star stops, they come into the house, verse 11, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, look at this, and fell down and worshipped him. Now that's, that's quite odd to worship something that isn't God, isn't it? It's like idolatry? No, because he is God in the flesh. When they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. Matthew 8. Behold, there came a leper and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. Jesus put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will be thou clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. So notice, even when, like with Thomas, remember when Thomas said, my Lord and my God, didn't rebuke him. They said, my Lord, they worship him. He receives it. How can he, unless he's God? Matthew 14, 31, And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were come into the ship, the wind ceased. This is after Peter walks on the water. Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. Matthew 28, And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them. This is after the resurrection. You know, they, they, they see the tomb empty. They run in to go tell the disciples. Jesus meets them on the way. All hail, and they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Matthew 28, Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. So notice how Jesus responds to worship. He receives it. But look at it in Revelation. You know, in Revelation, John is shown a lot of things by an angel in Revelation. And it says here, and I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. So John, such in awe, he's shown all these things by the angel. He actually goes to worship the angel, right? Look at how the angel responds. Then saith he unto me, See it, thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book. Worship God. See, this is the right response to somebody worshipping you when you're not God and you're not claiming to be God. Right? He's, don't worship me, worship God. What did Jesus do? Jesus receives that worship. Now the last section I want to talk about is just, just divine acts of Jesus. Things that Jesus does, but then you know, God does also. So how can they both be doing it? Well, it's because Jesus is God. John 14, 13. This shows that Jesus answers prayer. Look at what Jesus says here. Whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. How, how does Jesus answer prayer unless he's God? If ye shall ask anything in my name, look at this, I will do it. So you see how he's telling the disciples, I will actually be the one hearing your prayers and answering those prayers. Right? So he makes that statement. Mark 2. This shows Jesus forgiving sins. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their heart. Why did this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? Isn't that interesting? See, who can forgive sins but God only? So, you know, when you, you know, the Catholic priest say, oh, my son, my, your sins be forgiven thee. Is he claiming to be God by doing that? Who can forgive sins but God only? See, Jesus can because he is God. And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, why reason ye these things in your hearts? 
Whether it is easier to say of the sick of the palsy, thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, arise, and take up thy bed and walk. I can't help but think Jesus is like flexing a bit here. He's saying like, you know, which was easier, you know? Forgive people of their sins, which was easier for me to forgive them of their sins, or to heal somebody completely. But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath, hath power on earth to forgive sins. Say to the sick of the palsy, arise, take up thy bed and go thy way into thy house. And immediately he arose, took up, took up the bed and went forth before them all. And so much, they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw it on this fashion. John 14, 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. So the Comforter is the Holy Ghost. Who is sending the Holy Ghost? The Father. But, you know, it's funny because, you know, some Muslims believe the Comforter is Muhammad because they say, well, who is more comforting than Muhammad, right? But the funny thing is in John 15, verse 26, who's sending the Comforter? But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. So I know a lot of online sort of apologists will say, well, that doesn't that show that Jesus Christ is God? He's the one sending Muhammad. If Muhammad was being sent, Jesus Christ is the one doing the sending. You know, isn't Jesus Christ then greater than Muhammad? Jesus Christ raises himself. Jesus answered and said unto them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, forty and six years was this temple in building. And will thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. So you see how Jesus here is saying to the Jews, if you kill me, I will raise myself up. But who raised up the Lord Jesus? This is a, a salvation verse. John, Romans 10, 9. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that who? That God hath raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. Galatians 1, 1. Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. So God raised Jesus from the dead. God the Father raised Jesus from the dead. But Jesus is saying, I will raise it up. See, because he's claiming that I am he, like we saw in John 8. And this is the last one, Revelation 22, 6. And we talked about this one before. Jesus sends his angel, right? And that's who the Lord God sends. He said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. Revelation 22, 16 is later on in the chapter. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, and the bright and morning star. So we've raced through all these verses, but you can see that there are so many verses that we can use to show that Jesus Christ is God. Now, the deity of Jesus Christ is not just something that Christians believe due to traditional vain worship. Why well, is it not such as Christians just made up this doctrine? They just want to worship Jesus Christ. They just want to worship the Son of God. That's why they made up this doctrine. No, the scripture is abundantly clear. And I'm sure that's not even an exhaustive list. I'm sure like, I've missed some, right? But these, I think, are the best ones that show that Jesus Christ is God and it's a clear teaching of the word of God and it's a critical doctrine to salvation right? if you believe not that I am here you shall die in your sins alright let's pray Lord we thank you for your word and uh, we thank you that it reveals to us who Jesus Christ truly is and Lord we thank you that through salvation we receive this truth and uh, Lord we thank you that you know, you are our saviour. We're not believing on a man. We're not believing on some exalted being. We are believing on you. Uh, God manifest in the flesh who shed his blood for us. We thank you, Lord, that you loved us in this way. Help us to know this truth. Help us to understand this truth. Help us to defend this truth. And help us, Lord, to preach this truth. We pray and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.